Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Asim, one of the paediatric trainees here in Wales and one of the presenters for Dragon Bites. This week we have the second half of our episode on breastfeeding. Dragon Bites hosts Thomas Cromarty and Stacey Harris were joined last week by two experts in the field of breastfeeding. First was Dr. Vicky Thomas, a consultant paediatrician based at the Great North Children's Hospital, and by Dr. Ilana Levine, an ST6 based at Thames Valley Deanery. We're going to complete the episode today and pick up from where we left off last week. So if you haven't heard the first half, it might be worth popping back to listen to last week's episode before you carry on with this one. Anyway, let's get started. Can I, can I just ask about the, you know, you talked about the, the various flashpoints where there are often concerns and, and that's periods where, where mothers will, will stop breastfeeding. What, what are those flashpoints? Are, are they, just very basically, uh, I know you mentioned that um, there might be a certain point when the breast changes tissue and things, but w- what are the main ones for us to know about? So classically, you, you see a bit of a growth spurt around about two to four weeks where you've got a baby that often will do quite intense cluster feeding. And that's often read by families as there's not enough milk, they're not being satisfied. And then as Ilana referred to, often around about six weeks, the breast milk supply, I, I'd say about six weeks, wouldn't you, Ilana, is that? But uh, the breast milk supply seems to regulate and it becomes controlled by Um, emptying and filling the breast and whether the baby is actually taking milk out and it's much more of a making milk to order uh, instead of sort of storing milk up what you've got to remember about breasts is that they are factories they're not warehouses does that make sense they're rivers they're not lakes so there's milk constantly flowing in Um, and women sometimes go from this point where they're feeling very full and you'll often see women, I always laugh when people have those feeding reminder bracelets um, or or tags to put on their bras, because I think what you often see with more experienced breastfeeders is they they sort of do a subtle little way up of their breast with their hand. There's that very typical hand gesture that most of us who breastfed have done where you sort of discreetly try and cup your own breast to work out which is the fullest one which is the one that you're due to feed off Um, but as breastfeeding progresses the breasts don't tend to fill up in that way the milk is generated in response to the baby going to to attach to the breast Um, and often round about that six weeks um, you see women suddenly freak out that oh my breasts don't feel full anymore and, and that's right. That's what's supposed to happen at that stage. And I think um, uh, as paediatricians, we have a massive role to play in this, don't we? You know, um, because um, we're really trusted. And um, I know this is probably one of the myths that you that, you know, and perhaps we have stories of um, mothers um, or parents who have had um, various comments from paediatricians, which have made them which have perhaps um, exacerbated these feelings of um, like, reduced milk supply um so i think it's just so important that um we are able to um to be educated enough to be able to know what is normal and to be able to support and encourage um women and to be able to say this is okay um you know you can get a little bit of extra support but this is fine you know you're doing really well um rather than perhaps uh having having someone doubt their 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 supply instead And I think also we shouldn't forget about the postnatal SHOs because although all of those other points are important, the actual really massive drop off in exclusive breastfeeding comes in the first week of life. So by one week, the 2010 National Infant Feeding Survey said that less than 50% of babies were being exclusively breastfed and the initiation rate is above 80%. So what an incredibly massive drop off we're having in the first week of life. And a lot of that is even in hospital. So I think that the role of the postnatal SHO is actually so important for breastfeeding. And yet it's something that we don't train our poor SHOs on at all. And often people haven't even had their own babies by that point. So they often look back on the advice that, you know, we've given as postnatal SHOs with absolute horror. 
you know we have, yeah we have I do. Contact with so many babies at the baby check and also yeah. with these babies with perhaps very mild issues jaundice related sugar related where we can really have a really negative effect if we don't understand what breastfeeding solutions there are you know of course our job is to keep babies safe medically but there's so many things that we can do to protect breastfeeding at the same time as keeping babies safe and also knowing when to butt out, you know, when this is normal and this is not something for a pediatrician to be involved with. So so within that first week then, what you, you just alluded to a couple then, jaundice and, and, and hypoglycemia, are they the main two reasons that um, people would, would start to introduce other feeds? No, I would say those are the main two reasons that we would be involved. Yeah in some way that we could damage, but certainly not the main two reasons for people to, to stop exclusively breastfeeding. So Sanjeev Deshpande presented at um, UNICEF a few years ago about babies with hypoglycemia who were um, given supplements and or uh, moved from being with their parents to being in the neonatal unit. Um, and actually a large proportion of those babies hadn't even had a blood sugar measured. So they were being given s- supplements without a blood sugar recorded um, without a detailed assessment just because I think maybe we feel that that's safe and I think that comes back to what I think is our intrinsic distrust of breastfeeding as paediatricians because we have um, often relatively negative experience of, of it professionally and because the babies where breastfeeding is going well do you know what we're not seeing them <laughs> they, they're not they're not in hospital because they're well babies where it's working um so it's really important to know that you know estimates of true insufficient milk supply are somewhere between maximum five to ten percent um but if all you ever see is babies where mum's um, milk supply seems to be insufficient then you're going to think that most most women can't breastfeed aren't you um so i and i think that's just really important to have a think about and there's also huge impact about what we do as physicians around about the time of birth um that impact on on how well breastfeeding will go so we just need to be aware of how important our actions and our attitudes are I think that um, it does come back to another aspect of insufficient milk supply that we haven't talked about, which is that very early one where people feel they don't have any milk because it's just colostrum. And so I've spoken to so many parents at baby checks who've said, yeah, I'm breastfeeding, but I don't the milk hasn't come in yet. So, you know, I'm using some formula at the moment. Um, And the other aspect is that kind of day two or night two baby that suddenly wakes up to the world and wants to feed a lot. And then mother's feeling that they haven't got enough milk and the baby's too hungry. So I think those are probably the the really predominant reasons that people stop exclusively breastfeeding even in hospital. So you mentioned about um, so you mentioned about uh, some mixed feeding. Um, I, w- I wondered if we could talk about that a little bit, and because um, you said that there's been various um, not reasons, but um, mixed feeding has been introduced for whatever reason. Um, but does that, have, does that have consequences for breastfeeding, and what you know what what are the pros and the cons to that? So I think mixed feeding is really poorly understood. And while we're talking about up, uh, uh, about resources, there is an upcoming book actually dedicated to it by um, an IBL, IBCLC called Lucy Ruddle, um, who's, who's talking about mixed feeding support for families who either choose to do it or who um, need to do it for medical reasons. Um, I think we've just got to have a think about, and this is, I guess, where listening comes in, when families are talking about mixed feeding, we need to be looking at why that is. I personally, if I could ban some phrases, I would ban exclusive breastfeeding because I know to us as physicians, it means solely breastfeeding, but exclusive in other contexts kind of means desirable or um, or, or aspirational. And I think that, that those connotations have sort of merged in to the way that we're talking about breastfeeding as well. So I would rather talk about solely breastfeeding and when I'm talking with families who are mixed feeding I tend to call it inclusive breastfeeding that is you're including all of the breast milk that you can into feeding your baby as well as some other sources I think when families want to introduce formula early on we've just got to have some honest conversations about the potential impacts of that on breastfeeding so we know that early introduction of formula feeding Um, can reduce the duration of breastfeeding 
And that's partly, we don't know 100% why, every time you um, give a bottle or feed other than from the breast in those early days, because breasts work on a supply and demand mechanism, especially in that first two to six weeks of breastfeeding, you'd still need to tell the breast to make the milk. Does that make sense? In order to um, get that milk supply established. So mixed feeding um, for non-medical reasons in the first six weeks of life, while somebody's still establishing their milk supply, you just need to have an honest conversation that if the baby's not feeding at the breast, the breast and the brain aren't getting those signals that this is the amount of milk that's needed to be made by the body and that you might find that there's a down regulation in milk supply as a result. The other thing that you need to talk about with families who are using anything other than um, entire breastfeeding so it is looking at responsive feeding so how you're delivering that milk to the baby in a way that mimics the physiology of breastfeeding. Um, are you doing babies flat on their back with a bottle in their mouth so it's drink or drown which unfortunately is a practice that I still occasionally see in hospital settings um, or is that baby sat upright with close eye contact being able to moderate their own milk intake as they choose. Um, there is a risk people talk about nipple teat confusion I think there is something about flow preference so babies who are used to be being fed um, will probably want to get to the point where they get the milk with the least possible work and if they're used to a, a, a rapid flow coming from an alternative form of feeding then they might not um, feed as well at the breast one of the really simple tips that I have picked up somewhere I'm not sure where about bottle feeding is just to pinch the teat for the first two to three sucks on the on the teat when you're bottle feeding to replicate the baby sucking on the breast before there's a letdown so that the baby doesn't get into the habit of thinking milk comes straight away and then gets bored at the breast. I don't think I, there's any science behind that. If I'm honest, I've never seen like a RCT on whether that's a good idea, but sometimes you don't need an RCT to suggest that replicating physiology is not going to be harmful. So I think it's really important to say that I would support any family using formula who needed to for medical reasons or who wanted to by choice, but they just need to know that um, supporting ongoing breastfeeding whilst introducing um, bottles, that there are some, some tactics that can help. I think also we should be aware, I've heard definitely from um, families of babies with quite complicated medical conditions that they don't feel that um, paediatricians value breast milk when it can't be exclusive. So, or, and when it can't be direct. So I think it's also important to know that mixed feeding is valuable. And that if uh, a family can't exclusively breastfeed or can't directly breastfeed their baby because of medical problems, it doesn't mean that the breast milk should, you know, is, it doesn't have value and that we shouldn't be supporting families to do mixed feeding or pumping and bottle feeding of express milk. Um, so breast milk is valuable, not only for the direct breastfeeding experience, not only for the nutrition, but for lots of other reasons. So if somebody needs to, exclusively express milk and feed their breast milk entirely in a bottle, that's still good. If somebody's going to partially breastfeed, even if that's just for comfort, even if there's hardly any milk there, but the baby likes to breastfeed and the mother likes to breastfeed at the breast, that's great, particularly for a baby with medical problems where it can be so useful for comfort and analgesia. Um, so I think it's important for paediatricians to remember that breast milk has value and breastfeeding have value, regardless of how much infant formula might be necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I just wanted to mention here, just so, because I think it's something that's not particularly well known about, um, and we don't have to go into it in detail, but um, just that um, you, there is ways of feeding babies that is, that is other than breastfeeding, that isn't with a bottle. So you can get the um, another system, can't you, where they where the, the baby actually breastfeeds, but perhaps doesn't have um, all breast, you know, breast milk. They have um, some milk in a in a bottle around the the person's neck, and then um, there's a little tube that goes into the um, baby's mouth. So they so they have other milk as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's what we call a supplementary nursing system. And you can either buy commercially made products, or you can make your own from an NG tube um, that goes into into a bottle. Um, and perhaps I can send you some pictures, Stacey, of those in use, because I think until you've seen one. And essentially what you do is take the tube that's like an NGE tube and you tape it right next to the nipple. Um, and then in the bottle, you've either got um, some formula or some maternal express milk or some donor human milk. 
and the baby's feeding at the breast and getting what milk mum can supply directly, but also getting any additional input that they, they need. Um, and I, they, they are Marmite. Some of the families I've worked with absolutely love them. Some find them really fiddly and faffy, um, but they're great um, for some, some families in some situations. I think, Elani, you've got some cup use experience or did you want me to talk about cups? And... Um, I have more of a knowledge of the research side of the cups. <laughs> the cups the cups are great. When I was a, pediatrician, a junior pediatrician, I really thought a lot of the time, you know, you've got this baby and they're struggling to get milk and then you show them a cup and they like look at you with this expression of you, what now? <laughs> um, but you, you use a cup or you can almost use like a, a shot glass um, <laughs> and rather than at home you could you could hypothetically should you have such a thing use a shot glass um and you just put it to the baby's lips and you're not tipping milk it's really important so you're not tipping milk into the mouth um you're not force feeding but what they'll do is they'll for some babies who who take to this method of feeding they'll stick their tongues out and they sort of lap the milk up like a little cat it's quite sweet um and that can work really well if you're trying to for whatever reason um utilize alternative forms of of feeding other than um bottle feeding um, you can syringe milk in responsively um, and you can use spoons and in fact if you if anyone's a call the midwife fan there's a lovely story of a 24 weeker in the call the midwife books um, who was spoon fed D did you want to talk about the science behind cups with your <laughs> well I think you know like many things related to breastfeeding there is very little research around um, and we certainly don't have any research about the role of supplemental nursing systems and whether they are better than using bottles or any of that kind of thing. Um, we have got some research around cup feeding, not in term babies, but in preterm babies. Um, and the Cochrane review on cup feeding showed that it did protect breastfeeding. So breastfeeding rates were higher at discharge and a few months down the line. Um, but for when introduced early as kind of the first transition to oral feeding alongside breastfeeding, um, it prolonged length of stay for these preterm babies. If it was introduced later, then perhaps that had less of an impact. Um, and the other factor about cup feeding is that there was fairly poor compliance. So families and staff didn't necessarily like it very much or find it very easy. Um, so those are the factors around cup feeding. So yes, we have some evidence to say that it does protect breastfeeding, but there are some practical difficulties with it. Um, and then the other way of avoiding bottles in the preterm population is to do home tube feeding, so nasogastric or orogastric feeding at home. Um, and again, there's not that much research around, but it does seem that that also protects breastfeeding. Um, so that may be a preferable method to get babies home and breastfeeding earlier than the cup feeding. But lots of different units do lots of different things around the country. Mm, thank you. It's really um, great to bring in uh, this research. I'm learning a lot as we go along. Thank you. What resources do you have for the kind of supplemental feeding, mixed feeding um, that we can signpost to? So the Baby Friendly Initiative, UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative, has some specific resources on responsive feeding and what that means. Um, and also, I think there's a top 10 of what people who are bottle feeding need to know. And of course, bottle feeding doesn't mean formula feeding. We tend to use that in kind of public consciousness. It tends to be the same, but bottle feeding can be breastfeeding. It's just using a bottle as well. So many people who are exclusively breastfeeding need to know how to responsibly bottle feed because they may need to be expressing milk alongside. I have another question, if that's OK. Um, say, say we were to... Um be working and we had some parents who'd come and who had actually kind of got one of these flashpoints and been convinced for some by someone to um to to stop breastfeeding maybe they're two or three days down the line or maybe they're four or five or even a week what what kind of advice can we give um about when it's when it's too long when it's not too long what uh how we can improve getting getting back onto breastfeeding if if it was a you know a a myth was the reason why they stopped in the first place. So if I, I'll start with that one, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> it's a really good question. I think people sometimes think that breasts like have an on off switch <laughs> and it's more of a dial. Um, I, I guess if I, if I could get people to take one key learning point away, it, the, a lot of breastfeeding and breast milk supply is around that responsive feeding, is around supply and demand. The more you feed a baby, the more milk you will make. That's why um, tandem feeding, which is feeding more than one child at, the t at a time, um, be that twins or be that children of different ages, um, works. That's why wet nursing works, you know, that which was what happened to sick babies and to, to aristocratic babies for generations. Um, 
because the body responds to more um, babies feeding at the breast by making more milk. Um, to give you some figures, we usually say it takes about six weeks for breast milk supply to downregulate to the point where there's no active production of breast milk. But at any point, um, you can stimulate ongoing breast milk production. Um, so women are often seen by their GPs because months or even years after stopping feeding their babies at the breast, they'll find that if they um, if they touch their breasts in the shower, for example, they can express some drops of milk. And actually what often happens is that they then get in the habit of going, oh, is this still happening? So they're giving that sort of inadvertent stimulation because every morning in the shower, they're checking, am I still making milk, squeezing a few drops off and then making more and more milk because they're, they're causing that stimulation. Um, so we know that in other cultures, it's relatively common for older female relatives, including grandmothers of babies, to breastfeed. Um, and in other cultures, babies are fed by their grandmothers, sometimes when their mum's not around, or their aunties, or their mum's best friend. So if you've ever lactated, it is possible to um, upregulate that lactation. It's more effective the sooner you start doing it, and it's more effective the more stimulation you provide. But if you see a family and they're saying, oh, we stopped breastfeeding a week ago, and you find out that it was because of poor advice, um, it's entirely possible for breastfeeding to resume. It's, it's possible physiologically. What I would say is that it's really important to sensitively work with families around what they want, because sometimes a family feel, a, a mum can feel, you know, I'm just done with that. And so rather than going down that excitement of, well, you know, grandmas can, and I've done this, well, if grandmas can relactate, it's entirely, you could do it, you could do it. And because I am a woman of enthusiasm, I, I am prone to that sort of response. Um, and I, I think it's only by learning to watch and, and read the room a little bit. For some families, yes, they're very sad that breastfeeding has come to an end, but it has come to an end and they don't want any more information about it. And so in that situation, if, when you're reading the room, the response is very much, you know what, we're done. We're sad that it's done, but we are done. Just leave that door a little bit open and say, I completely hear how you're feeling. Um, if there's any if, if there's any change in that feeling, here's some places that you could go to. Um, and also just really remember to congratulate them for getting that far, because any breastfeeding at all um, is an achievement. And I think we should always remember to congratulate and acclaim families for what they've achieved, um, rather than saying, oh, what a shame, you only breastfed for two weeks. Oh, brilliant, that's two weeks of breast milk you gave your baby, well done you, you know. Mm. That's a really important point, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. And, and, and apart from uh, stimulation, whether that's with a baby or with hands or whatever, um, what other, I mean, the other the techniques that I've heard, um, you know, is, is getting some of the, the baby's clothes and putting it down um, in the bra. Are there other, other tips like that which can find useful or have got evidence behind them? Well, I don't know about evidence, although I know there's some, there's some good stuff around um, using mindfulness and meditation, isn't there, to, to help with a, a comfortable headspace. Practical tips I tend to suggest to families, um, you know, if they're, if they're pumping and smell is a really powerful association so something um, that smells of your baby um, can be really helpful i tend to suggest that families look at pictures of their baby when they were well so if they've got a sick hospitalized baby um, looking at them as they are you know especially in the intensive care unit where i'm supporting families um, looking at your baby in the bed with multiple tubes and monitoring on can be quite distressing so i suggest you know look at photos of them when they were well and happy um, and and think of those feelings because adrenaline is a potent inhibitor of oxytocin and you need oxytocin for a letdown. Um, there were some fascinating studies, sorry if I'm going off on a tangent here, but there's some fascinating studies in the 80s that I don't think you would get kind of ethical approval for now, where they demonstrated that stressing women out had a direct impact on their milk ejection reflex and their likelihood of having a letdown. Um, and the ways that they did this was stuff like, put their feet in freezing cold water or ask them to do ask them to do difficult maths um, or give them tiny, tiny electric shocks I think was one of the studies um, and it will be no surprise whatsoever that if you ask a woman to do difficult maths or um, 
immerse her feet in ice cold water or give her a small electric shock at the time she's trying to express milk for her baby it doesn't work well (laughs) (laughs) i expect that study was organized by a man (laughs) oh well we couldn't possibly say that um I also, I, there is, I think, very little evidence base behind this at all, but I also suggest to mums who are expressing, especially under pressure, um, that they sit and have something to eat, something nice to eat, especially some chocolate. And there's a tiny, a tiny bit of uh, physiological sense there, isn't there, that um, chocolate, we do know, um, does have some endorphin production. So um, it, it probably won't won't harm to eat something nice while you're <laughs> And skin to skin as well. Clear. of course yeah. yeah yeah how could i've not mentioned skin to skin <laughs> and skin to skin isn't just for newborns um and it isn't just um for in hospital you know you can do skin to skin with older babies and children um and it's really good for physiological regulation um, um so another thing that uh, we've got going back to um being a pediatric sho and i can remember being asked the this sort of question when i was a pediatric sho um is um you know can this you know can you breastfeed if the mother's taking this medication um and i just wondered if you had some top tips for what 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 we should do if we're asked that question yeah so i think the first thing to know is that currently the bnf is not uh, a good source for quantitative information about breastfeeding and medications Um, And there is some work going on to try and make that information in the BNF better, because obviously that is our go to source. And so it'd be amazing if we could rely on that. Um, So perhaps in the future, this will change. But at the moment, the nice guidance on postnatal care says not to use the BNF when thinking about medication safety and lactation, because it's not sufficiently quantitatively based. There is uh, an NHS service called the UK Drugs in Lactation Advisory Service, so UK DILAS. Um, which is run by specialist pharmacists um, in Leicester, I think they are based. Um, and they have basically a kind of BNF for lactation. So you can search by drug um, at the top of the web page and then click on the lactation information um, section and it will give you much more information um, about the possible safety or not of, of a particular medication. And they also have very useful fact sheets that you kind of look at groups of medications, so say antidepressants or analgesics and talk about the relative merits. So that is a really fabulous resource and you can actually ask them specific individual questions as well if you want to. Um, another source is the Breastfeeding Network. So um, Breastfeeding Network is one of the lay charities um, that, that do support support of breastfeeding. Um, and they have this fabulous pharmacist um, who has had an OBE for this work, um, who Wendy Jones has put together lots and lots of fact sheets about specific medications, which are extremely evidence based. And she's put all the evidence in there. So although it's not an NHS resource, I think it's fabulous for doctors who are prescribing medications to be able to look at the actual evidence there to make their own decision. Um, So obviously we don't tend to be the ones who are prescribing the medications, so it's not our responsibility in that sense. Um, But we can certainly be on the side of the mum by pushing back a little at people knee jerk saying, no, you can't breastfeed on this medication, which we, we know is a massive problem that people tend to just immediately tell mums to stop breastfeeding because of various medications. And most of the time, those medications are actually pretty safe in breastfeeding. And if they're not, there are often alternatives that are safe. And if they're not, then there needs to be a sensitive discussion about what's going to happen. Um, but really, the number of medications that are seriously contraindicated in breastfeeding is probably, you know, fingers of one or two hands. Um, but all the time we're hearing about mums being told to stop breastfeeding for things like ibuprofen, paracetamol, antidepressants, which are completely unnecessary. I think people too often conflate pregnancy with breastfeeding. Um, and although the, the two conditions physiologically um, are associated and often chronologically associated, they're not the same. You've got to remember that in pregnancy, there's a shared circulation. So what's in mum's blood is in baby's blood. But breast milk, although it's actually, I often think of it as a blood product, it's not this. It's not the same as having a shared circulation. Um, and you know, you you're consuming this stuff via your gut. Um, you've got your first pass metabolism. In in the US, one of the leading um, experts on maternal um, medication use in breastfeeding is a, a pediatrician um, and. Her, when I saw her speak, she she said, um, you know, you've got to remember the bottom line is if you would give it to a, a baby 
you would give it to a breastfeeding mother. And I think that's that's worth thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've not met that we're, we're getting to an hour now. So um, I think we should try and just bring it to a little bit of a close. Um, but um, you guys have um, you have you have started um, uh, well, it's, it's been going for a while now, hasn't it? Uh, the hospital infant feeding network, and we've not even mentioned that. Um, um, that's a really, really, really great resource um, for um, paediatricians or anyone um, who's involved with um, looking after babies and mothers, isn't it? Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about it and um, <laughs> if that's OK. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't mention that um, Vicky and I co-chair the Hospital Infant Feeding Network, which we set up a few years ago. Um, and it was actually kind of given birth to from another network called the GP Infant Feeding Network. Um, which was obviously set up for GPs to learn more about breastfeeding and infant feeding. And within that context, we realized there were a huge number of hospital, doc hospital doctors who were also really interested in this field and felt that there were lots of hospital specific issues. Um, so we decided to set up the hospital infant feeding network as a kind of sister to the GP infant feeding network. Um, and I think that both of those websites have an incredible amount of information that people might find helpful um, and people that, that people should know about and look at. So initially we, we set it up with a focus on learning and sharing resources and sharing expertise about feeding issues within hospital. Um, and it is very highly kind of multidisciplinary and multi-professional. Um, so not just paediatricians, which people tend to think about, but lots and lots of different adult doctors in different departments who come across people who are lactating and also children who are being breastfed, um, but also many, many other professionals um, so obviously pharmacists and nurses and all kinds of different people are involved in the hospital and feeding network. Um, but we also came to, to have a bit of a role in the advocacy sector, I think, um, which was um, something that we definitely are very happy to do. Although it wasn't possibly the first thing on our minds when we actually set up the network. Um, so we've done a lot of advocacy on um, formula sponsorship, for example, of um, health professional associations and conferences. Um, we had a campaign about separation of mothers and babies um, when either one is, is admitted to hospital. Um, and the most recent advocacy that we did was about the um, COVID-19 vaccines when there was a kind of knee-jerk reaction to prevent breastfeeding mothers from having those vaccines without any particular physiological reason. Um, and thankfully, um, that obviously was reversed earlier in the year. So we were very happy about that. So there's a website, hifn.org. There's a Facebook group for people to join if they're really passionate about these things. Um, we have lots of resources like posters on the websites. Um, we do some collaborative audits. So at the moment we have a collaborative audit on excessive weight loss um, and there is still time for people to join that if they want to. Um, so that's looking at the rates of excessive weight loss and hyponatremia in different units across the country. Um, and we also have a focus on equity. So we're part of um, a group that's working on providing images of uh, breastfeeding related conditions in people of different skin tones, because we know that actually the, the breastfeeding uh, support world is, is quite dominated by white women historically, uh, and the images are also quite dominated of, with, with white breasts. So we don't necessarily have a good idea of what mastitis looks like um, in somebody with a black breast, for example. Um, so that's an important issue for us. Yeah, it is an amazing resource. Thank you so much for all of the work that you have done and are doing still. Um, uh, we have mentioned lots and lots of other resources um, during the podcast, but I just wondered if there was anything that we hadn't mentioned that you wanted to um, just mention to point people in that direction. Um, so something that I've been working on recently with a lactation consultant called Lindsay Hookway is a, an education package called Breastfeeding the Brave. That's about breastfeeding hospitalised children. Um, if you Google Breastfeeding the Brave, Lindsay's done a really beautiful video about the um, research she's done around families' experiences of breastfeeding their children who are, who are sick, but outside the neonatal and maternity unit setting. Um, and that package should be available next month. It is going to be extraordinarily reasonably priced. Um, and there's going to be a lot of information there. It, it may be particularly applicable to paediatricians listening to this podcast. Um, and uh, I think it could, it, I'll, I'll share a bit more information about that so that you can put that in the in the resources section if that's okay. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. I think yeah. other um, sources of, of education for pediatricians would be um, there's a free e-textbook um, by somebody called Patricia Wise that's called Supporting Mothers Who Breastfeed that's just targeted at health professionals. And there's also a, a real textbook that you have to pay for, <laughs> which Vicky contributed to, um, which is called A Guide to Supporting Breastfeeding for the Medical Profession. 
Um, there's various e-resources. So um, the UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative have an e-learning module for paediatricians, which is very good. Um, that has There has to be a subscription involved, but uh, many units do have a subscription for you to be able to do that. And there's a GP version as well. Um, there is also a set of free e-learning resources on uh, a site called Open Pediatrics, spelled the American way. Um, and the package is called Bella Breastfeeding, and there's various modules on there. Um, and there's a few different modules on e-learning for health as well. Some are part of the Healthy Child Programme. And if people are really passionate and want to do a significant amount of training, um, then the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers um, has courses specifically for health professionals that can take up to a year because they're really very intensive. Um, so, yeah, depending on people's level of interest, those are a few possibilities. And from an international flavour, um, I already mentioned the global health media videos, which I just think are brilliant and really nice detailed videos, um, for especially for getting that experience. Often, even as an experienced paediatrician, you feel a bit uncomfortable getting up close and personal to babies and breasts um, while, while feeding's going on, so they can give you a really good view. Um, and also the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine is a US-based organisation um, led by uh, physicians. So that can be a really useful um, set of resources to look at there. And they've got protocols um, which can be used in the UK setting as well for a number of different conditions. And I guess people who are listening to this like podcasts. So um, uh, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine does have a podcast called Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, and Vicky and I have also enjoyed a recent podcast called Anthrolactology, which uh, comes kind of looking at the breastfeeding field from an anthropological perspective. Wow. I, yeah, I hadn't even thought about breastfeed, another breastfeeding podcast. Wow. Yeah, awesome. I just wanted to say, um, from, from my point of view, thanks so much for talking to us and me and everyone today. Um, there's lots of learning and all, with all those resources, there's plenty of homework as well. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I uh, kind of hear, hear a lot or, or give the information a lot is that if, if parents were to ask or mothers were to ask for 10 different opinions, they'd often get 10 different answers. And one of the things that I think I've taken from today is that, that as a, well, as, as a, as a man anyway, not having any breasts and at the moment not having any children, that I'm not being expected to be an expert. And I think that will help one of those kind of 10 different bits of advice, not being mine necessarily. And I can just be more supportive and listen. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for, uh, well, making me feel less bad about not being an expert and just being able to um, be signposted towards giving some really kind of practical and helpful advice. Um, so, yeah, you know, thanks. Tom, as a consultant, I say, I don't know a lot more mm. than I did ever as a trainee. And I just think that's one of the, the most important bits of um, your latter stages of training is, is kind of going, it's okay for me not to know this, but I'm gonna go and find someone who does. Um, I think the problem in breastfeeding historically has been that it's an orphan area. And so no one has been taking responsibility for it. And a lot of people have, have felt pushed outside of their comfort zone. Um, so I think it's, it's great to see such interest from paediatricians about being better at this and supporting families better. There is one resource that I forgot to mention in the earlier thing, which we need to definitely edit in, <laughs> um, which is First Steps Nutrition Trust. So yeah. they, um, <laughs> Vicky is a trustee of this organisation. Well, um, yeah. Sorry, we'll add that in. Yeah. In, 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 all, in all, that we didn't ever forget it. In yeah. all fairness, Helen would be would and the whole board of First Steps Nutrition would be honest about the fact it's not a breastfeeding resource. There's almost nothing about breast milk and breastfeeding. Um, but you're absolutely right. First Steps um, is an independent charity providing information around um, infant and young child feeding. Um, they do amazing breakdowns of commercially available products um, in a way that I just don't think anybody else is doing. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right to flag it up, Ilana. Um, and certainly when I'm teaching medical students, historically, the first thing that they always wanted to know about when I said, what do you want to know about childhood nutrition? What do you want to know about infant feeding? People would always straight away ask me how much milk a baby should be having and what was the difference between the milks? So um, the First Steps website answers that beautifully. And I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Vicky Thomas and Dr. Ilana Levine for helping us so much in recording this episode. There was a lot of fantastic advice there and lots of really useful information about the evidence base around breastfeeding.
Before we call this week's episode to an end, I just want to briefly mention some excellent emails we've had from listeners of Driving Bites. Just so you're all in the know about the fact that we do read your emails and we will get around to answering them in the future. So I won't name anyone by name, but here are some useful suggestions that people have put forward to us. Uh, So this is from a doctor in Wales. I have some suggestions which I would find super useful and have a Piku slash Niku theme to them. Ventilation, neonates and the older child, inotropes, fluids, sedation and pain management. So that's something we'll be having a look at at in the future and hopefully we'll get some episodes out to you about those. Next, uh, we have a listener from Malaysia who's requested a podcast on murmurs. We've touched on murmurs separately in different podcasts about congenital heart diseases. However, I suppose it would be really useful to get out an episode about murmurs on its own. So we'll have a look into that for you as well. Thank you. And finally, we've had another email from a trainee based in the northeast of England who was wondering if they could get a podcast on neonatal research and pro tips for trainees dealing with extreme preterms at delivery or stabilisation. I just wanted to say thank you for that request as well, and we will get on it as soon as possible. So I wanted to also say thank you to all our listeners. Please keep your suggestions coming in to us, and we will work on them in the background. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening to Dragon Bites.